It's a great pleasure to be here at the Breaking Convention. And I'm trying to tell you in the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes what we are doing using this kind of uh, live models of the human brain that we call the brain organoids. So uh, there are several ways that you can uh, work. Oh, please. I don't know what's happening here. OK. There are several ways that you can work with, uh, or, uh, with the brain. So basically, you can use EEG, as, you, as we saw in uh, previous presentations. We can use with, uh, work with neuroimaging. If you are, this is some kind of a no-invasive kind of uh, uh, approach to explore the brain. But also, we can work with post-mortem brain tissue and also uh, with um, um, animal models. Besides that, there is another way that you can <coughs> use to work with, uh, with the <coughs> human brain. And this is uh, based on the stem cells. There are some kinds of stem cells that we call pluripotent stem cells. And then these cells can give rise to any cell type of the body, including uh, brain cells. There was a technique that was developed by this guy, Shinya Manaka, in 2007, in which it, you, he can get a piece of the skin that's a very ordinary cell, like a fibroblast, and make this cell become a pluripotent stem cells, which, in, in other words, makes this cell become a, like an embryonic stem cell from the same individual, like going back in time. And because of that, he won the Nobel Prize in 2012. So it's a very uh, elegant way to get these uh, cells from a specific individual, from the skin of them, and then make them neurons, for example. We improved a little with this technique. And uh, besides getting the skin, we can also get urine. So in our urine, there are some cells. So we can get the cells from the urine and make them neurons. So with that, like, we can create uh, nerve stem cells, astrocytes, uh, neurons and different cell types of the brain, and uh, this is how we, we used to work in the, in the lab. Besides that, we also can create what's called brain organoids. So basically, these are some uh, uh, aggregates of cells that grow up to five to six millimeters, and they have the layers that we see in the, in the brain, and also we can work with the connections and the synapses and everything that you can see in the real brain. But they came from the skin of your urine of uh, any one of you in this audience, for example. And uh, we improved a little bit also this technique with the uh, collaboration of some mathematicians in Rio de Janeiro. And we uh, started to play a little bit more about the way as we grow those cells. So I don't know if you can see there, there are three examples of these brain organoids with dark spots. Can you see the dark spots there? So they were, they were a little curious, what would be these dark spots in these brain organoids growing? And then we decided to cut them. And then we realized they were like eyes. So we have like these brain organoids with eyes. So it's interesting because it gives us an idea about the complexity of this kind of tissue and how interesting that can be to understand <coughs> several aspects of uh, brain development and also the effect of different compounds. So this paper is published. You guys are interested to publish this in the beginning of this year. So there are different ways that we can work with these brain organoids. We can look from them from outside. This is like a, the one imaging of these brain organoids. They are, looks like a heart, but it's a brain, a, brain, a mini brain. Uh, the more red is more uh, number of cells. And you can also look from inside. And this is inside of these brain organoids. Each of these uh, clusters of green cells, they are actually areas where the cells are, are proliferating. So we call this these neurogenic kind of uh, areas that are making these organoids grow. And we can also can uh, detect electroactivity activity on these brain organoids. So we put them uh, above one uh, plate with this uh, multilateral array. And then we can identify this activity. So it's a very interesting model to play with the live human brain tissue. OK, but it's cool, it's interesting, it's beautiful. But what exactly can we do with those kinds of uh, cells? So this is just one example. So for example, we use this kind of approach to show the link between microcephaly and, uh, and the Zika virus. I don't know if you heard about the Zika virus, probably yes. And in Brazil, we had a huge outbreak about Zika virus that was associated with an increase in the number of cases of microcephaly. But it was not clear on that time, like three, three years ago, exactly if the Zika virus was causing microcephaly. And uh, using this kind of approach, we were able to confirm that like Zika virus was causing uh, microcephaly. So it's a, an interesting uh, uh, example of how can we use this kind of uh, uh, model to understand the, the, the brain development and the effect of different uh, things, including virus. So we, we published several papers on this line of research, working with uh, Zika virus. And uh, one of the most important of them is that we found two compounds that can be used eventually in the case of another outbreak for the pregnant women. So it's an interesting thing that hopefully we don't need to use. But if that's the case, 
we have the compounds. And what can we do with these brain organoids regarding the uh, psychedelics? So uh, there's something interesting that like you guys know more than me that like there are not so many new uh, psych psychiatric drugs. We have like a lack of new compounds over the years regarding several aspects of uh, uh, neurological and psychiatric diseases. And uh, it's interesting because now we are uh, living this uh, psychedelic renaissance. And uh, we thought that maybe it would be a, a, an interesting opportunity to apply this kind of uh, approach to uh, start to study the, the psychedelics. One thing that is important to mention regarding the psychedelic renaissance in Brazil, that's maybe it was one of the only examples in the world where the religion helped the uh, work of the psychedelics. I don't, know, I don't know if you guys are aware, but like in Brazil, it's legal to use uh, ayahuasca since 1984. And because of that, the scientists become uh, more uh, uh, possible to, to, to use the, this, the psychedelics. I don't know if you guys uh, saw probably yes, some of these uh, religions associated with, this, with the ayahuasca, for example. This is the Santo Daime. And uh, two or three years ago, I wrote an article for the Brazilian newspaper, O Globo, regarding and showing exactly this kind of uh, interesting thing that's like the uh, freedom to, uh, for research based on the religion. So it's an interesting example of how it, it helped in Brazil. And that was interesting because yesterday I was, what, I was watching that uh, movie, Hybridus, that was playing here in the, in the cinema. And uh, I, I just saw my, my brother in the movie. So my brother was in the movie here. <laughs> And he's uh, the, the author with me, and he's an anthropologist, and he's also a musician, but he's also in the uh, Santo Daime Church. So it was a great surprise for me to see him here in the movie yesterday. Okay, because of this kind of uh, opportunity that we had in Brazil to work with uh, ayahuasca, these guys were very pioneers there, Draulio Araújo and Siddhartha Ribeiro. They were the first of them in 2011 to show activation of the occipital lobe based on, on the ingestion of uh, ayahuasca. And after that, they published several other papers regarding uh, not only the effect of the ayahuasca in the, uh, in the, in the activity of the uh, occipital lobe, but also antidepressant effects and other effects associated with the consumption of, of ayahuasca. But what I realized, not only talking to my brother, but also to, to these guys, is that they're still missing lots of these molecular and cellular uh, aspects or mechanisms associated with the psychedelics. Of course, you know, all of them, they. Uh, have some kind of a link or they activate serotoninergic receptors. But what exactly happens downstream of this effect? What happens within the cell, not only in terms of the cellular aspects, but also in terms of the molecular that they are activated or the proteins that are activated after the uh, trigger of the serotoninergic receptor caused by the uh, psychedelics? And this is what we decided to do, to try to study psychedelics using these uh, brain organoids. So why it's interesting and why we, uh, we propose that this is a very uh, useful model to study psychedelics, because at some sense we can uh, split, we can divide all of the effects that have, uh, that, uh, have been described with the, the uh, psychedelics. For example, you have the uh, psychotomimetic effect caused by the activation of the uh, serotoninergic receptors. We have these antidepressant effects. You have the non-tropic effect. You have the anti-inflammatory effect, and you have the cell death uh, or cell survival effect. So it's interesting because depending on the kind of behavior of those cells, we can uh, speculate or, and we can understand a little bit more all of these different of, of these different aspects of this framework that is triggered by psychedelics. And this is our proposal using these stem cells and reorganoids to study these uh, compounds. So let's see uh, our first studies using uh, ayahuasca. Of course, it's not so easy to basically get the brew of the ayahuasca input in the cells. We have to look for specific compounds that are uh, present in the brew. So one of these compounds that are mostly present there, one is called harmine and the other is NNDMT. So now I'm going to show to you what we did uh, using uh, harmine. Harmine is a beta carboline that's uh, is uh, well known as a monoamino oxidase inhibitor. What does it mean? It makes the DMT uh, be available in the brain without being destroyed when you ingested it. So the combination of the plants is important because our mind uh, is, preserves the integrity of the DMT to reach the brain. 
but we decided to ask, is there any other effect that, uh, uh, that uh, is directly from the harmine inside the brain? So this, is, this was our question. And uh, the answer is yes. So harmine is able to increase the proliferation of uh, uh, neuroprogenitor cells in our model. Why it is interesting? Because if you get, for example, uh, very well-known uh, antidepressants as Prozac, they also uh, do the same. They also increase what's called neurogenesis. So when you think about cells, when you think about this kind of model, when you see a uh, proliferation of uh, neurostem cells or neuroprogenitor cells, it can be some kind of a sign of uh, uh, antidepressant effect. As we know, our mind is able even to, to link to the uh, serotoninergic receptors, but inhibits both monoamine oxidase, that's very well known, but also another enzyme that's called DIRC1A. And then we ask it, which would be the, the, the pathway that like, makes harmine increase the proliferation of none of these neurocells? And the answer is that it inhibits the proliferation, or it uh, activates or uh, increases the proliferation of these uh, cells based on the inhibition of the DIRC1A. Okay, what's it, what's it, why is it so important or is interesting? It's because DIRC1A is a marker of Alzheimer's. It's some kind of, uh, the activation of the AQ1A is associated with dementia and with Alzheimer's. So it's, it's a, in that sense, it's very important. So basically what happens is that even if you go to patients with Down syndrome, I don't know if you, if you know about that, uh, even children with Down syndrome, they have the plaques, they have some of the characteristics of the Alzheimer. This is caused because the APP gene is located in the chromosome 21, and the people with... Uh, down syndrome, they have three copies of the chromosome 21. So in the, in the, the increase in the levels of dirq one is able to activate this cascade that goes directly to neurodegeneration. And it's based on the accumulation of APP and tau that are markers of the uh, Alzheimer. Because of that, we thought that would be interesting to examine what would be the consequence of the uh, harmine activating cells within the brain organoids. So the first thing, of course, we have to confirm the, these cells in the brain organoids, they have DIRC1A, as expected, right? This is the green uh, dots that you can see. This is a section of these brain organoids, and then what you're seeing there is the uh, marker uh, DIRC1A. And uh, then we, what, what we did, we exposed these brain organoids to harmine, and then let's see what happened with them. To, to, to make a long story short, how we did it. We exposed those cells to, to harmine, and then we basically break the whole tissue and get all of the proteins that they are there. And that our goal there is to see what, was the, what were the proteins that are going up or down. So based on this kind of puzzle, we can then infer what are the signaling pathways that are being uh, changed with the, uh, the, that, that were triggered by harmine. We found that harmine is able to uh, alter the expression of 155 proteins. It's something interesting, but you can imagine how big can be this puzzle, right? And uh, then using uh, different algorithms, algorithms, I'm not going to have time to explain to you, but you, you use different softwares to try to uh, put back this puzzle, to, to see exactly what are the pathways that are being altered by Harmine. So we saw, for example, as expected, that the harmine is able to upregulate ATP binding. Actually, this is how the harmine uh, blocks the activation of the one a And then we started to uh, look for different uh, pathways that were being altered by harmine. For example, in terms of synapses, the communication among the cells. So this communication among the cells, the synapses, can be upregulated by harmine. The other things that we found is that these other aspects of this traffic of, uh, of uh, uh, substances within the cells, of molecules within the cells, that's also being activated or altered by harmine. And uh, it's interesting that, like, for Alzheimer and Parkinson's, these are some examples of the pathways that are being activated by harmine. And finally, for this part of, of the talk, even the accumulation of this uh, uh, beta amyloid, that's the, the APP pathway, has, can, can be inhibited with the uh, harmine. So basically, I don't know if I was clear enough, so we have this Brain organoids, we expose them to this compound, then we break this uh, tissue, and then we check for the, the, what are the proteins that are being up and down. Then we use the softwares to try to track exactly what are the, the, the pathways that are being altered by, by this compound. So basically, to summarize this part, this is what we, we see. We see some clues that like pathways associated with neurodegeneration 
can be reverted with harmine. There are two other aspects or two other uh, trophic factors that are important for the survival of the neurons that are also being decreased in the uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. One of them is called NGF, neurotrophic growth factor, and the other is called, is, uh, called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. So let's see how they behave when you add harmine to the brain organoids. Actually, they increase. So there is an increase in the expression of these both trophic factors in the brain tissue when you expose them to harmine. So uh, basically, this is what we're working with this part. And now what we are doing, this is work in progress. We have also brain organoids from uh, familial cases of Alzheimer. And so this is a very rare case, case of uh, Alzheimer in which they have a genetic mutation that make them uh, become uh, with the disease. And what I'm showing here to you, I don't know if you can see this uh, kind of aggregate of green uh, spot. This is a plaque of Alzheimer that we can confirm that's happening inside the brain organoid of the Alzheimer patients. So now our goal is to see if you can block the formation of these plaques in this model using harmine. We don't have this result. It's, uh, it's coming soon. So this is what I have to show to you regarding harmine. Now, now let's move to the second uh, compound of the ayahuasca, that's NNDMT. That this is the compound that uh, usually uh, gives us the psychedelic uh, effect or sensation. So one thing that we found using the same kind of approach, brain organoids, in that case, being uh, exposed to NNDMT, is that you have an increase in proliferation, too. You have uh, the neurogenesis is also being increased in the brain organoids. Again, thinking about the uh, antidepressant effects of uh, ayahuasca, this could also be, uh, it can, this can explain what we see in the, in the, in the subjects uh, that are uh, consuming ayahuasca. And what's interesting in that uh, data is that if you block the uh, receptor of serotonin, you uh, block the effect, the neurogenic effect. So it looks like that the effect of the uh, NNDMT uh, increase in neurogenesis depends on the uh, serotoninergic receptor. One thing that's interesting if you think about uh, different antidepressants is that there is some kind of latency, there is some kind of delay on how on, 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 until when they are going to, to, to uh, give the, the, the beneficial effect. And the, the classical ones, there is a huge delay on that. And, but all of them look like that depends on the, uh, uh, the production of BDNF. That's that factor that I showed to you. And so one thing that we did is that let's see how the neurons behave regarding the formation of new synapses when they're exposed to NNDMT. And then we use it as a control, the BDNF. And that's interesting because both NNDMT and BDNF, they are able to increase the formation of these new synapses. And so we believe in and we propose that this may explain why you have this rapid antidepressant effects of ayahuasca as was shown by the group of uh, Draulio in, in, in Brazil. For the last part of my presentation, I'm just going to show to you what we are doing using similar approach, but now with the uh, psychedelic 5 mu DMT that comes from this uh, Sorona uh, frog, right? The idea is the same, just expose the brain organoids, in this case, to 5 mu DMT. And what was amazing, at least for us, is that in that case, with 5 mu DMT, you change it 1,000 proteins. So there is an alteration in the number of 1,000 proteins after uh, one single exposition of this brain tissue to uh, 5 mil DMT. And uh, I'm sorry, it's very uh, small, but the idea is basically to show to you that like using this kind of, of algorithms based on the amount of the proteins that are changed with the exposition the, of, uh, with uh, 5 mil DMT, we found, for example, that the, the Signaling pathway associated with inflammation, with uh, neuroinflammation, is inhibited by 5 mil DMT. And, and on the other hand, you have an increase in the proteins associated with uh, long term potentiation, memory, and brain plasticity. So, with this kind of approach, we can go a little bit more uh, specific, try to understand what are the consequences of the uh, activation of serotoninergic receptors based on, the, uh, on psychedelics. And this paper is, is already published uh, in, this, in this journal. And uh, more recently, the group of uh, Natal, where Siddhartha and Rolio are, uh, are located, they showed in, in this other paper that 5 mil DMT indeed increases uh, neurogenesis and uh, brain plasticity using uh, mice as a model. 
So this is how, what we are proposing using our, our models. You have this kind of a latency of classical antidepressants because they depend on the increase in the levels of serotonin. And then you have to activate uh, signaling pathways such as cyclic, cyclic EMP or um, MAP kinase CREB, et cetera. And then you go to increase the levels of BDNF and then you go to uh, activate or to modulate the synapses. What we believe that happens with the uh, psychedelics is that instead of that, you have a shift in this kind of uh, effect. So you are going to change the formation, the plasticity on the connections among the cells faster because you are playing faster with the DNF. This is what we are trying to, to, to explore using these uh, models. So just to summarize my talk, I showed to you that like beta-carbolins such as harmine and DMTs, 5 mil DMT and NNDMT, they are able to alter neurodegenerative and inflammatory signaling pathways, suggesting that there can be uh, therapeutically potential against Alzheimer and dementia. Of course, this is a proposal. Now, with this kind of uh, uh, clues or, or discovery, we can go a little bit deep and, uh, in uh, proposing it as really uh, some kind of uh, new medicine for dementia and uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And the other thing that like, we are proposing is that this typical psychological consequence of psychedelics, such as changes in perception, and uh, also the antidepressant effects, that depends on this fast and strong modulation of neurogenesis, and also in this uh, neuroplasticity signaling pathways that uh, I, I, I try to show to you, based on our model, that are also altered by different compounds. And I, specifically, this part of this antidepressant effects, they are very important in Brazil right now. We are living in a very complicated situation. Most of you guys are aware. The man that's governing Brazil basically cut half of the uh, budget for science. And uh, we are going to have 100, almost 100,000 uh, students and uh, researchers without salary, without fellowships, on the next month. It's a very complicated situation. To make things, to make things even uh, worse, this, uh, this is the, the, the man that we, it's called president in Brazil. And uh, this is what was uh, published in Scientific American Nature. There was uh, one uh, lecture of uh, Siddhartha Ribeiro, who was uh, one of, our, of my colleagues. And uh, suddenly, four soldiers appear in the, in the lecture to take pictures. Nothing happened, just the, the pictures, but it was a very demonstration of intimidation to the scientific community. So it's, uh, we are very, the, the situation in Brazil is very weird. But as I try to say to my children, let's be optimistic and not, not, let leave the pessimists for better days, because now we should be optimistic, because if not, we're going to get crazy. Yeah. Yeah.